Is it possible that, at least occasionally, after death, some incorporeal essence of an individual, what we might call a spirit, instead of passing into the afterlife, remains bound to our world to dwell amongst, and perhaps even interact with, the living? In other words, do you believe in ghosts? Such entities are known by many names, said to take many different forms, and have all manner of motives attributed to their presence and actions, but Fundamentally, nearly every culture has a concept of something like this. The United States is no exception. In fact, the country is home to some of the most famous, bone-chilling, and mysterious encounters with ghosts ever reported. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. This is the Campfire series. In this video, we're going to tell and examine several of these stories. If legends are to be believed, a phantom may manifest practically anywhere where there was once a tragedy. A ship, a library, an amusement park, or it may even dwell along a particular road in its surroundings. On Archer Avenue in the village of Justice, Illinois, which lies just southwest of Chicago, we find one of the most famous examples of such a road-dwelling spirit with a ghost known as Resurrection Mary. Our story begins in 1939, with a young man named Gerard Palis. One evening in that year, Palis went to dance at the Liberty Grove Hall and Ballroom, a building that no longer stands. While there, he noticed a girl by herself. The girl seemed to be in her early twenties. She had blonde hair which reached down to her shoulders and blue eyes. She wore a white ball gown with white dancing shoes. Palis approached her and asked her to dance. The young lady agreed. She was reportedly a charming and friendly girl, but very quiet and strangely cold to the touch. They danced together and by some accounts even kissed. At the end of the night, Palis offered her a ride home, which she accepted. She told him that she lived at an address in the Bridgeport area of Chicago. However, without explaining why, she requested they travel down Archer Avenue on their way there, an unusual, out-of-the-way route. As they did, she soon asked him to pull over next to a Catholic cemetery along the road called Resurrection Cemetery. There, she told Palis that she had to cross the road and that he could not follow. Before he could react, she exited the car, ran across the road to the cemetery, and vanished before she even reached the cemetery gates. Palis was dumbfounded by what he had just seen. The following day, he visited the address she had given him. An older woman answered the door. When Palis asked her about the girl he had met, she informed him that she had had a daughter, but that she had passed away some time before after being killed in a car accident. She invited Palis inside and asked him if the girl he had met resembled the girl in a photograph she had of her daughter. Palis replied that, yes, this was the same girl. Palis's encounter with this mysterious spirit is the earliest claimed, but it was far from the last. It was followed over the decades by numerous other stories of encounters with the spirit who came to be called Resurrection Mary, after the cemetery to which she is generally said to be trying to return, and because her name in life was evidently Mary. Before long, she had become the most famous example of a category of ghosts called Vanishing Hitchhikers. There was a string of reports in the 1970s and 80s in particular. She was typically reported as a girl likely between 18 and 30, with blonde hair, sometimes said to be curled above her forehead. She was said to have had unusually pale skin and wore an old-fashioned prom dress that was usually white. Some said the dress was yellowed, though, as if it had been left in the sun. She would appear in a variety of locations. This included local ballrooms and dance clubs. According to some, no one would recall seeing her entering or leaving. She would simply be noticed in the room at some point in the night. It was said that she would be quiet and keep mostly in the background, but one witness claimed to see her dance by herself in what was described as a kind of pirouette-type dance, a pirouette being a kind of ballet turn. This same witness, Robert Maine, a manager at Harlow's nightclub in the 1970s, said that she would look right through you if you tried to speak to her and respond only by shaking her head. More often, though, she was reported by drivers who observed her on Archer Avenue. She would often be standing by or wandering alongside the road at night. She would agree to offers for a ride. Such cases generally resembled Payless's experience. She would enter the car, be very quiet and awkward with the driver, instruct them to stop as they passed by the cemetery, and then vanish. 
Sometimes, she would be seen suddenly darting out across the road in front of drivers, only for their vehicles to pass right through her in what should have been an impact. One noteworthy incident occurred on August 10, 1976, at around 10.30 p.m. A police officer named Pat Homa was called to the cemetery when someone reported seeing a girl wandering around it after hours. When he arrived, he did not find a girl, but did discover that, strangely, two of the bars on the front gates had been pulled apart and were now bent, and that there were what appeared to be handprints left on the bars. What's more, there were black spots over the handprints that looked as if they were made from something burning the bars. In fictional adaptations of the story, Resurrection Mary is often portrayed as a violent, vengeful ghost. But it does not seem that there are any actual reports of aggression, violence, or even anger. Rather, in general, she seems distant, vague, lost. Who is, and was, Resurrection Mary? There are multiple different versions of the story of her origins, but most of them roughly follow these lines. In life, she was a girl whose name was indeed Mary, who passed, likely, in her early twenties. One night, she went to dance with her boyfriend at the O. Henry Ballroom, a building that was later called the Willowbrook Ballroom. However, Mary and her boyfriend entered into a heated argument. Mary left the building and decided to walk home by herself. However, as she walked along Archer Avenue, a motorist struck her and killed her, then fled the scene, never to be identified. Her parents found her body later that night. She was buried in the nearby Resurrection Cemetery not long after. How much of this can be verified? Many of the figures responsible for reporting encounters with the spirit, like Gerard Palis, were real people. However, Resurrection Mary herself is harder to identify, at least with certainty. If Palis really did end up going to a house and speaking to the woman's mother, we don't know who it was, and the address was never recorded. Searching old records for answers is a bit of a daunting task. Resurrection Cemetery serves as the resting place of over 150,000 individuals. However, a few stand out as potential candidates for the source of the legend. Perhaps the most popular candidate is Mary Bregovi, a 20-year-old woman reported by the Chicago Tribune to have been killed in March of 1934. She was evidently out driving with friends when their vehicle was tragically struck by another car. However, Though she was buried in Resurrection Cemetery, her death itself took place about an hour's drive away from the area. Furthermore, Mary Bergovi had short, brown hair that did not extend past her chin. Resurrection Mary's blonde hair is practically a defining feature that is almost always reported. But what about proof of the existence of the ghost herself, regardless of who her identity in life was? We don't quite have that either. The case does stand out in that there were quite a number of independently made reports of encounters with the spirit. However, unfortunately, the case does not seem to have been extensively researched, and so most of it is limited to what are admittedly only stories. Stories which are oftentimes vague, lacking details, and which may even contradict each other. Furthermore, though the legend probably does stretch back to at least the 1930s, which is suggested by the fact that the middle-aged at the time spoke of the legend as something with which they had grown up, there were no officially reported encounters until the 1970s. Palis's 1939 encounter, for example, was not officially documented until he had a filmed interview in 1986 with researcher Richard T. Crow. Crow, a local resident and full-time ghost researcher, was the main figure responsible for researching the case, collecting local reports, and popularizing the ghost on a national level through his ghost tours and conversations with reporters, authors, and television programs. Some would suggest that while the legend may indeed long predate recorded reports, and may even derive, albeit loosely, from the real death of Mary Bregovi, the story has many of the hallmarks of a fictitious urban legend, such as that the prevalence of sightings seemed to correlate with the extent to which the public was excited by the topic. There was a very clear uptick in sightings in the late 70s and early 80s in particular, when the subject was receiving national attention, which dropped off substantially in the early 90s. Crow had a different explanation. He argued that her increased appearance in this period was attributable to a disturbance made to her grave shortly before this time. He noted that, in accordance with the original contracts, new graves were being placed above much older ones at this time. Mary Bregovi's grave was evidently one such grave, although this isn't clear. There is some ambiguity about where her grave is and what happened to it. 
Some suspect it was hidden by the cemetery to decrease visitors coming only for the legend. At the apex of its popularity, the legend was attracting crowds. There is one very prominent piece of physical evidence, though. This being the metal bars which were bent, had handprints on them, and then were blackened as if they had been burned. A cemetery worker present throughout the period, Chet Kowalkowski, claimed that the bars were bent when workers accidentally backed a truck into them. He claimed that they did try to blowtorch them back into place, and that the handprints apparent on them were those of a worker's glove. The police officer who first observed the bent gate bars, by the way, appeared on the TV show That's Incredible in 1982 to discuss them. Crow asserted that the officer was fired for doing so, but the local police chief stated that he knew nothing about him being fired. That is the sort of ambiguity that underlines this case. Many of those originally involved, such as Crow and Palis, are sadly no longer with us to defend or clarify their positions. Even the Willowbrook Ballroom burned down in 2016. Was Resurrection Mary ever out there? Could she still be to this day? Until something more tangible arises, it will remain a mystery. Whether you believe in the story or not, though, should you find yourself in Resurrection Cemetery, remember, it is a cemetery either way, so be sure to respect the cemetery rules, the dead, and their graves. The Santa Lucia Mountains, a 140 mile long mountain range running along the coast of central California. It is a beautiful, albeit desolate, and eerie landscape. Many areas along this mountain range are popular destinations for hikers, sightseers, and travelers. However, there are some who absolutely refuse to venture to this area, specifically the area known as Big Sur, where the mountains meet the sea, because of what is claimed to reside here. They are not typically said to have ever harmed anyone. On the contrary, they seem to avoid contact, keeping a distance, appearing and disappearing so quickly that one can rarely get a second glance at them. But encountering these apparitions is such an unnerving, uncomfortable experience that some feel they are simply best avoided. They are known in Spanish as Los Vigilantes Oscuros, in English, the Dark Watchers. The Dark Watchers are described as tall, perhaps up to ten feet tall, shadow-like humanoid entities. They are mostly featureless, apart from the hats and cloaks they are sometimes said to wear and walking sticks they sometimes carry. They are occasionally depicted with hollow, white eyes, but this may be a feature that has been incorrectly assumed, as they are not often included in witness descriptions. They are most commonly, but not always, witnessed in the evening or early morning, standing on tall rocks, motionlessly observing passers-by. They often appear for only a brief moment before vanishing, and will certainly disappear if approached. As such, there are no known claims of close-up observations, nor photographic or video evidence. No one seems to know who or what the Dark Watchers are, be they ghosts or some other kind of entity, or what their intentions might be. It is also not clear how long they have been there. It's often claimed that they were known to the Amerindian peoples native to the region, specifically the Chumash. However, the Chumash do not seem to have made mention of them in their mythology, according to Thomas C. Blackburn, who has studied their mythology extensively. However, the legend is certainly at least a century old, probably older. Their Spanish name suggests they were first observed at the latest, in a time when the land was ruled by Mexico, or even the earlier Spanish. The first clear written mention of the Dark Watchers, however, dates to 1937, when Robinson Jeffers wrote of them in his poem, Such Counsels You Gave to Me. American author John Steinbeck also referenced them in his book The Long Valley, in a story within called Flight. It is said that both Steinbeck's grandmother and mother believed in the Dark Watchers, and would occasionally even leave them gifts near Mule Deer Canyon. Steinbeck's son, Thomas Steinbeck, would also claim to have observed the Dark Watchers in his childhood, and go on to research them extensively, publishing the book In Search of the Dark Watchers in 2014. What could the Dark Watchers be? There are a number of practical and supernatural explanations. As always, multiple could apply simultaneously. Regarding the paranormal explanations, because most first-hand accounts are stories of fleeting glances and nothing more, it would be difficult to ascertain much about them even if these are supernatural beings. There are some who would connect them to a larger phenomenon of what are called shadow people. Shadow people are precisely what they sound like. They are shadowy, humanoid entities reported all over the world. 
Like the Watchers, they are often said to briefly appear before people, often in one's peripheral vision, so fleetingly that one can hardly make out any details about them. There are instances, though, in which an encounter with a shadow person is not so brief. There are some who have claimed to have been haunted, stalked, chased, and even attacked by these entities. It's an interesting comparison, but we should be cautious. There are also practical explanations for what is happening. For example, as we discussed in my video about British cryptids and other legendary entities, people's shadows can be projected in unusual ways under the right circumstances, especially when they are at high elevations in foggy weather, such that an observer might see what appears to be independent figures in the distance. It is relevant that the figures typically appear at dawn and dusk, when shadows are the longest. Another explanation is simply that people could be briefly seeing things which they mistake for humanoid entities in the corners of their eyes, only for them to disappear when these things are observed more closely. Research into what's called pareidolia makes it clear that the human mind very easily finds significance in visual patterns that are not actually meaningfully connected. Finally, some argue that these figures are simply the products of the imaginations of travelers suffering from heat, exhaustion, and solitude especially in the past. It is an established fact that things like sleep deprivation can cause hallucinations of things like shadow people. Anxiety and solitude can trigger the feeling that one is being watched. With the legend born and in the back of travelers' minds, things they would have otherwise dismissed as insignificant may have instead been turned into the figures of these legends by their frightened, tired, or excited minds. Ultimately, it is a question which requires further investigation. Whatever the Dark Watchers are, optical illusion, products of weary minds, or supernatural entities, they have been there for centuries, and likely will be there for centuries to come. There are many who would argue that it is not simply one of, but is the most famous American ghost, if ghost is an appropriate label to describe whatever it was. The events that led to its fame, according to legend, began over 200 years ago in Robertson County, Tennessee, near what is today the small city of Adams. It was here that between the years 1817 and 1821, the Bell family would be subjected to the presence of an unwelcome visitor in their home. History knows this visitor as the Bell Witch. John Bell Sr. and his wife Lucy had moved to Tennessee in 1804. They were wealthy farmers who would go on to have seven children in total, five of whom lived with them throughout their experiences. Along with the family, the Bells also owned a number of slaves, who worked and lived on their 1,000-acre property with them as well. The area they settled was sparsely populated, but those who lived in the area formed a close-knit community. Life in general here was fairly typical for the age. That is, until one evening in 1817. On this evening, John Bell was walking around his property at dusk when he noticed a peculiar animal in the distance. It looked like a dog, but he couldn't quite tell, as the animal appeared to have the head of a rabbit. He shot at the creature, and it ran away. Bizarre as it was, the sighting of this creature might have been forgotten were it not followed in the coming months by sightings of a number of other curious things. For example, one day while playing outside, their 12-year-old daughter Elizabeth, known as Betsy, witnessed a girl in a green dress swinging from the branch of an oak tree in the woods. She tried to approach this girl, however, when she did, the girl vanished. Just as it was becoming clear that these inexplicable experiences were to be a regularity, in the late spring of 1818, whatever was responsible for them entered the bell house itself. Odd noises, like knocking, clawing, and gnawing sounds, the sounds of chains rattling, the sound of someone choking, and the sound of dogs fighting would be heard in the house, but the source could never be identified. Eventually, the strangeness began to affect the Bell's persons. Their bedsheets would be pulled off of them in the night. The children would be scratched, and they would be smacked across the face while they slept. Betsy was reportedly targeted the most of the children. Of all the family, however, John Bell Sr. seems to have faced the worst ordeal. Soon, he came down with a strange illness that caused his tongue and mouth to periodically swell, hindering his ability to speak and eat. This, they believed, was connected to everything else that was occurring. In spite of the heavy burden that was placed on them, the Bells kept these incidents to themselves for around a year, fearing how claiming to be haunted might affect their standing in the community. Eventually, however, John felt it necessary to find help. 
he spoke to his friend, neighbor, and minister, James Johnston, about his experiences. Johnston and his wife agreed to stay at the Bell House to investigate. Quickly, they learned, it was not shy around strangers. When they went to bed, the Johnstons heard many of the same disturbing sounds that the Bells did. Then, their bedsheet was pulled off of them. The following morning, Johnston concluded that it was a quote-unquote spirit, just like in the Bible, which was haunting them. After the Johnston's visit, the Bells began reaching out to others for assistance. Naturally, word of a haunting spread, not only throughout the community, but it seems across Tennessee and even beyond. Hundreds of visitors, some reportedly from quite far away, came by to visit and even stay with the Bells to attempt to examine and communicate with the spirit. Many left after enduring a frightening or abusive experience at the spirit's hands. Although, not everyone had a negative experience, and it was noted to have even been kind to some guests, and even some family members, in fact. It seems to have generally treated John's wife Lucy with compassion, for example, even caring for her during a period of illness. However, it was often malicious, consistently so towards John Bell Sr. Soon the entity began to communicate, at first very simply, but it eventually became fully conversational. The spirit is portrayed as somewhat playful, albeit wickedly so. It was able to change its voice and mimic others. It would share private information about others it obtained while visiting their homes, reportedly being able to travel as far away as England and back within moments. It would argue about religion with those who brought the subject up with it, displaying a thorough knowledge of theology. When asked about its origins, it replied that it was a spirit that was once very happy, but which had since been disturbed. However, it would go on to give a number of fanciful and contradictory explanations for its origins. It was the spirit of a wealthy European immigrant. It was the spirit of a Native American whose tooth had been stolen, etc. On one occasion, the spirit referred to itself as Old Kate Batts's witch. This was peculiar. Kate Batts was the niece of Lucy, as well as their neighbor. However, the families were reportedly not on good terms. Apparently, some years prior, Mr. Bell and Mrs. Batts, who was the head of her household, had had some sort of business dispute in which she felt cheated, so much so that she went so far as to swear revenge on him. Was this entity somehow connected to Kate Batts and the revenge she swore, or was this another one of the spirit's jests? When word reached Mrs. Batts about this, she was infuriated, but there were many in the area willing to believe it on account of her reportedly bitter personality and superstitious behavior. John Bell himself, however, reportedly doubted her involvement in anything. She had had conflict with him, but then she had apparently had conflict with nearly everyone in the community. Regardless, the spirit continued to respond to the name Kate. The haunting would continue for years. Visitors would continue to come and attempt to investigate all the while. It was claimed even a then military officer but future president Andrew Jackson visited for a night with a contingent of soldiers who allegedly found the ghost, as they said, more terrifying than the British Army. Meanwhile, John Bell's health deteriorated. What was once a swelling of the tongue had evolved into occasional facial spasms and seizures. By autumn of 1820, he increasingly found himself bedridden and sick. Then, on December 20th of that year, he died. As the story goes, a strange vial was found in his room. It was revealed to be poison. Upon this revelation, the witch then joyously spoke, taking credit for his murder. It apparently so detested John Bell that it was her to celebrate by singing drinking songs during his funeral. The following spring, their daughter, Betsy, became engaged to a man named Joshua Gardner. For some reason, the witch disapproved of this match and compelled Betsy to end their engagement, which, as the story goes, she did. This was the witch's last major act. Shortly after, it informed the family that it was going to leave, but return in seven years. True to its word, it disappeared and returned in 1828. This haunting was not as intense nor nearly as long as before, however, and it seems to have soon thereafter left. Lucy Bell died sometime around this time, and the original house in which this was said to have transpired was torn down. What can we make of this story? Well, the human characters mentioned were real people, or at the very least, based upon them. The Bell family even still has descendants living in the area, in fact. Verifying much about the original story beyond this, however, presents a challenge. Although there are a wide variety of variations to this story, the version that is usually told, including this one, is derived from Martin Van Buren Ingram's book 
An Authenticated History of the Bella Witch, published in 1894. This was over 80 years after the events in the story were said to have taken place. Ingram claimed to have based his work largely on a manuscript written by John Bell's son, Richard William Bell, in 1846, who was himself around six when these events transpired, called Our Family Trouble, which was purportedly given to Ingram to use by Richard's son, as Richard had died by that point. The authenticity of this manuscript is very much in question. Skeptics like Joe Nickel noted that there were some aspects of the language and style used in Richard Bell's purported manuscript which he believes suggests that the account was written much later on, likely by Ingram himself. Adding to this is the fact that there are no copies of the manuscript in existence outside of Ingram's work to be examined, and therefore there is no clear evidence that it ever existed, let alone clarity about what it originally said if it did. There was someone indirectly related to the case, a Mr. John A. Gunn, who vouched for the manuscript's existence and the validity of the information Ingram presented, but he had not actually experienced these things firsthand either. Indeed, there were not many firsthand witnesses, left alive at all by this point, if any, to assess the book's authenticity. Still, while we must consider that Ingram invented a fair amount of his story, especially things like Andrew Jackson's visit, he did not invent the entire thing. There are records showing that the Bell Witch legend, in one form or another, had been in Tennessee folklore prior to the book's publication, and some evidence to suggest that it really did arise in the time in which the story takes place. Furthermore, while the original witnesses had mostly if not entirely passed away, Ingram did claim to have also drawn his stories from their descendants, relatives, and others associated with them whom he specifically named, and who were still alive, who did not contest the book's veracity as far as we know. Although, apparently not all of them believed the story. Ingram himself did admit that there were a number of individuals who had known Betsy who suspected her of having invented much of the story, some suspecting the use of ventriloquism. Whatever the case, we are, for the most part, left only with stories that are perhaps now impossible to validate. Still, the legend endures well into the present, with many others over the years claiming to have experienced a number of other unusual things in the area themselves, especially other members of the Bell family. As a final note, though not strongly connected with the original legend, there is a cave located on what was once Bell's property that has been linked to the story in modern times. Some speculate that the cave was some sort of passageway from which the spirit came, to which it fled, and or, as some say, where the Bell Witch still resides to this day. Before we continue with the next story, I'd like to interrupt to annoy you, I mean remind you, that if you are enjoying the video so far, clicking the like button and subscribing to the channel helps the channel out tremendously and will make it easier to keep up with the videos like this that will be produced in the future. On to the next story. Los Angeles, California, November 17th, 1988. A 23-year-old woman named Jacqueline Hernandez, known as Jackie, is moving into a house in the neighborhood of San Pedro, not far from the Los Angeles port. Life is not well for Miss Hernandez. She has recently ended a difficult marriage and must now adjust to a new life, working two jobs to support herself, her two-year-old son Jamie, her soon-to-be-born daughter Samantha, and her cat. She knows that her life is going to change considerably, though she has no idea just how much. Nothing seemed out of place with her house at first. She did feel what she described as a presence while in it, as if she were strangely not alone, but she thought little of it. However, rather quickly after moving in, she would begin to notice many irregularities as she went about her days. The first thing that happened, she claims, occurred one night while her former husband was visiting. She claims they witnessed a container full of pencils placed on her desk suddenly move towards her on its own, then fall over. The two were shocked and completely unable to explain it, but she claims they did not obsess over it and it faded out of focus over time. In the coming months, however, more strange activity, including objects moving on their own, continued. She would also hear knocking noises or voices that she could not identify. Her cat would chase after strange shadows that would appear in her home. When, on several occasions, her friends witnessed some of this activity, it became clear that, for better or for worse, she was not hallucinating. 
The next major incident occurred one night in February of 1989 as she awoke at midnight to use the restroom. As she walked through her dark, quiet home, she peered into her son's room to check on him. She was met with a disturbing scene. On her son's bunk bed, on the unoccupied bottom bunk, sat a sinister-looking old man. She described him as having a corpse-like appearance with gray skin. He wore a red flannel shirt which was tucked into high-water pants. He simply sat there, cross-legged, glaring at her with an angry expression on his face. He then rapidly vanished completely. On another occasion, while her friend Christina Zivkovic was visiting, Jackie went into her attic to see what was in it for the first time, a desire unrelated to her encounters. As she stuck her head into the attic, she suddenly felt a powerful feeling that she was not alone. Moments later, she was met with a horrifying scene, a floating, disembodied head of what she described as a chubby man. The head rapidly flew towards her, causing her to stumble and fall. By the summer, Jackie was desperate for answers. After hearing about him from a friend, she contacted the prominent parapsychologist Dr. Barry Taff for help. He agreed to take on her case, and on the night of August 8th of that year, he and three team members arrived at her home to investigate, armed with a variety of high-tech equipment. Fascinatingly, the team experienced many of the same sounds, smells, and sensations that she did. At one point, team member Jeffrey Wheatcraft went up to photograph the attic. He claimed that while doing so, a force snatched his camera out of his hands and flung it across the room. Investigation continued throughout the month. Then, on the night of September 4th, Jackie claimed that the entity had become more aggressive than ever. It was continuously throwing things in her house. Panicked, she called the team. Wheatcraft, along with Barry Conrad and their friend Gary Bohm, arrived as quickly as they could. When they arrived, Wheatcraft and Bohm searched the attic again. They saw nothing, and they soon moved towards the exit to leave. However, while Bohm exited, Wheatcraft was intercepted. Those below heard him cry out. Bone rushed back up and immediately began taking photographs, using the light of the camera flash to try to see what was happening. The light of the flash revealed Wheatcraft had been hung on a nail protruding from a pole with a clothesline cord that wrapped around his neck. Bohm unbent the nail on which he was hung, and the two left the attic. Soon after, they all left the house to go on the porch. While there, a mark from an unknown red substance appeared on her baby daughter's forehead, which Jackie immediately wiped away. Jackie was now at her breaking point. After that night, she left the San Pedro house and soon moved away altogether. She and her ex-husband got back together to try to repair the relationship around this time. They moved in together a few hours north to a trailer park in the city of Weldon, California, never to return to this property. Over the next several months, Jackie would try to overcome her horror and resume a normal life. However, Jackie and her ex-husband eventually ended up separating again, and he moved out. She was now alone with her kids in the trailer. Or so she believed. Shortly after her ex-husband left, in April of 1990, life became strange once more. She began to hear scratching and banging noises at night. The odd lights she saw in San Pedro returned. Then, one day, she and her neighbors saw him. The face of an old man on the corner of her television screen. It was now abundantly clear that the poltergeist she had encountered back in San Pedro had followed her to her new home. When it became destructive, she again turned to the team for help, and Wheatcraft and Conrad soon arrived. As it was clear that whatever was haunting her was determined, it was suggested they use a Ouija board to attempt contact. The three of them, along with Jackie's neighbor Tina, met at her trailer to do this. They tried to set up video cameras to record the results, however, they claimed their equipment would not function. The spirit was said to have made its presence known right away, shaking the table on which the board was set violently. They began to question the spirit, with answers rapidly being given via the Ouija board. They asked, how many ghosts are there in here? The spirit responded, phantoms fill the skies around you. After further questioning, they determined that the spirit was supposedly a man who had been born in 1912 and died in 1930. He claimed to have been murdered, held underwater in the San Pedro Bay, and claimed that Jackie's home was once the home of his murderer who had gone unpunished. Jeffrey Wheatcraft then asked the spirit why it attacked him. It responded, Because you are the likeness of my killer. Conrad then asked if the spirit hated anyone in the room. The spirit spelled out J-E-F-F. -F. 
Then, an invisible force hit Wheatcraft, and each witness present claimed that he and his chair violently flew off the ground and back into the wall. Understandably, the session ended there. Later on, using the information obtained, Conrad was able to find a potential living match of the spirit. There was a seaman named Herman Hendricks who lived in the area around that time, whose corpse was found in the San Pedro Bay on March 25th of 1930, just as the spirit said, although this man was born in 1902, not 1912. He was wounded, which newspapers suggested was possibly a result of foul play. However, the coroner ruled that the man had drowned, and that his injury had been sustained while falling. Over the next couple of years, Jackie would move a few more times. Each time, inevitably, whatever it was that stalked her would return. Fascinatingly, the researchers involved in the case also claimed to have experienced unusual things in their own homes after the investigation as well. Eventually, however, the spirit's activity slowly diminished. What happened to Jackie Hernandez? Admittedly, every single version of the story I came across told it differently. I focused on the accounts given by Jackie and the others involved themselves, but even then, there were some discrepancies between their accounts, especially over time, and other areas of vagueness. A 1993 LA Times article even mentions a second, much more benign, but quite prominent ghost, who is mostly, if not completely omitted, from most other accounts, perhaps for the sake of brevity, perhaps the chubby man's head from the attic. Still, the story is consistent enough to work with. The number of witnesses to these events, the brazen, bizarre, and at times violent nature of these events, and the numerous photographs and video footage captured of some of the incidents, make it unlikely that this case is reducible to simply hallucination or the misidentification of everyday occurrences for the paranormal, at least not entirely. Indeed, practically everyone who has reviewed this dramatic, creepy, and exciting case has commented on the fact that it sounds exactly like something you would see in a Hollywood film. A skeptic must wonder, is this purely coincidental? It is worth noting that the parapsychologist Barry Taft's investigations had been turned into a Hollywood film before this occurred, the 1982 movie The Entity. Is it possible that this was, at least on the part of some involved, an attempt to create another movie-worthy story? In the 1997 documentary reviewing the case, titled An Unknown Encounter, at the 43 minute mark, a gate in the backyard appears to open on its own. They comment on the fact that it can't be the wind because there isn't any, while wind chimes can be heard in the background. This is only one example just within the documentary of them favoring dramatic conclusions about their experiences over practical ones. Was this a product of being perhaps a bit too excited over what they believed was really happening, or a sign that they were motivated to interpret everything this way? It's an accusation that must be considered, although it cannot be proven. But can the existence of anything beyond our understanding of the world having been active in this case be proven? Again, an abundance of photographs and footage was taken, and the spirit reportedly left numerous marks on her homes. But, regrettably, none of it was anything that cannot be faked or which clearly validates claims of paranormal activity, something which some of the researchers, who still claim to believe in the ghost, themselves concede. During the haunting, Jackie and the others noticed what was described as a blood-like ooze that dripped from the walls in her house. This was not only photographed, but a sample of it was even reportedly sent to a lab for analysis. It was confirmed to have traces of the blood of a man with high copper and iodine content. However, the scientist and laboratory involved in this testing evidently refused to be named, drawing skepticism. The house in which all of this began still stands, but none of its occupants before or after Jackie appear to have made mention of anything out of the ordinary. Was there ever truly a spirit there? Could it still be there, perhaps dormant for reasons beyond our understanding? Has it left to follow Jackie forever, or even another? Is it even possible for these questions to ever be definitively answered either way? While some ghosts, as we have seen, are said to be malicious or vengeful, most ghost stories actually seem to involve an entity which may be felt, heard, or even seen, but which is really a rather neutral presence, affecting the lives of the living minimally. For a true overview of America's ghosts, however, we must look at a spirit said to behave altruistically, whose hauntings end up benefiting the haunted. 
Polly's Island is a small island just off the coast of central South Carolina, less than an hour south of Myrtle Beach. It is a beautiful area that has been used as a beach resort since the 1700s. However, because of its location, it has often found itself on the front lines of hurricanes. There is a famous story of tragedy on this island, said to have taken place in 1822. One day in that year, a young man was traveling to see his fiancée and her family who lived on the island. The man had been away for some time, and the two were anxious to be reunited. As the man and his servant continued along their journey, they became thirsty. The man challenged the servant to a horse race to a nearby pond. During the race, the man noticed a shortcut through some marshes. He attempted to steer his horse through them, but his horse stumbled and he was thrown off and became stuck in the quicksand like mud. His servant rushed to free him, but he could not get him out fast enough, and the man eventually sank and drowned. When his bride-to-be received the news, she was devastated. She struggled greatly with his loss in the time following, spending many of her days roaming the beach in sorrow. On one occasion, she happened to come upon a man standing on the beach, staring off to the sea. The man was shrouded by the fog and difficult to see, but as she continued walking, coming closer to him all the while, she increasingly felt that there was something familiar about the man. Finally, at some point, she realized it was her fiancé. Overwhelmed, she immediately reached out for him, but, sadly, as she did so, he disappeared into the mist. She went home and told her family about her experience. Her father assumed it was a hallucination caused by grief. That night, the woman dreamt of her fiancé. She saw him standing atop a sand dune, calling out to her. However, she found herself adrift in a boat with no oars in a stormy sea, full of strange debris, unable to come to him. She awoke crying profusely. When she related this dream to her family hysterically, her father became concerned for her health and felt it was necessary for her to see a doctor. They left that day to travel inland to the city of Charleston to visit one. While they were gone, however, a hurricane ravaged the area. When the family returned, they found much of the island in shambles. However, their home was left untouched. The girl became convinced that her departed lover had been trying to warn her of this upcoming danger and save them from it. She soon thereafter overcame her grief. The story I have just told is only one of many attempting to explain the origins of a figure known as the Grey Man. His origin tales vary widely, though most of them involve a man taken tragically from his lover. The only thing that we can say for certain is that there was indeed a hurricane which struck Paldi's Island on September 27th, 1822, which killed hundreds. But while the details behind this tale may be lost to history, there are those who claim the spirit himself is not quite history. Whoever he is, sightings of a ghostly grey specter appearing in the area continue to be reported to this very day. The first written record we have of The Grey Man comes from the book Wacomaw Plantations, published in 1943 by Julian Stevenson Bullock. He wrote a more thorough account of the legend in his book the Return of the Grey Man, published in 1956, from which this story was derived. Eventually, individual witness reports themselves became famous. He is often said to appear to others much as he did to his fiancée. Witnesses sometimes report a figure emerging in the mist along the beach who appears to be a normal man until the witness comes close to him and finds him to instead be an apparition. Some say he looks like a sailor or a pirate from the 19th century, Others describe him as a much more vague, faceless figure, and still others say he wears a straw hat shaped like a turtle shell. He is never said to cause harm or to try to frighten anyone. Rather, his appearance is said to serve as a warning of an incoming calamity, generally a storm. According to legend, those who see the figure are also those who are spared from harm, with their properties often spared as well. In 1990, the ghost received national attention following Hurricane Hugo when a married couple, Jim and Clara Moore claimed to have seen the Grey Man two days before the storm hit in 1989. While walking on the beach, they passed a man walking in the opposite direction. When Jim greeted him, the man simply vanished. When the storm hit, the Moors evacuated the island. When they returned, they found their home had been remarkably spared from damage. Few of their neighbors were so lucky, however. The storm, one of the worst in living memory, had wreaked havoc on much of the island. According to some, the Grey Man can still be seen wandering the beaches to this day, with the last sightings at the time of this video's publication occurring shortly before Hurricane Ian in September of 2022. 
Some have even claimed to have photographed and recorded the figure on video. Is the gray man real? We cannot say for sure, but what can be said is, if you happen to encounter him while on the island, you should probably heed his warning. Before we end this video, it should be mentioned, while I strove for accuracy, the stories featured in this presentation were summaries. In the interest of presenting them within a reasonable amount of time, I could not include every detail in or explanation for these stories, especially something like the Bell Witch, which is a relatively huge topic. Furthermore, numerous other ghost stories were considered for inclusion in this video, but had to be omitted for the same reasons, even if they have a claim to equal fame. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. To support the channel further, there is a link to my Patreon in the description. A special thanks to my current patrons listed here. I also run a science channel much like this called Lucinox, so be sure to check that out too. Thank you for watching, and be sure to join us next time around the campfire.